Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. This is episode 150 and I am honored to have Professor Chris Blattman join me today. Chris Blattman is the Ramalee E. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the University of Chicago's Pearson Institute and Harris Public Policy. Chris is an economist and political scientist who studies poverty, violence and crime in developing countries. He has designed and evaluated strategies for tackling poverty, including cash transfers to the poorest. Much of his work is with the victims and perpetrators of crime and violence, testing the link between poverty and violence. His recent work looks at other sources of and solutions to violence. These solutions range from behavioural therapy to social norm change and local level state building. He has worked mainly in Colombia, Liberia, Uganda, Ethiopia and Chicago's Southside. Professor Blackman was previously a faculty member at Columbia and Yale Universities and holds a PhD in Economics from UC Berkeley and a Master's in Public Administration and International Development from the Harvard Kennedy School. He chairs the Peace and Recovery Sector at Innovations for Poverty Action and the Crime, Violence and Conflict Initiative at MIT's Poverty Action Lab. And when I started this podcast back in late 2014, Chris would have been one of the first people I had reached out to, mainly because of the interest I would have had in his type of research. And unfortunately, we never got to have that conversation up until recently, where he agreed to come on. And I guess it was a timely call because his research has pretty much moved on from the current publications that has featured his work. And he is working now on Columbia as well as the Chicago Mafia. And he discusses this type of research in this episode, which may be somewhat different to other episodes if you're used to listening to Chris featuring on other podcasts such as Econ Talk with Russ Roberts. And in this episode, as you guessed, we talk about crime and violence given his research and his many field trips that he undertakes to go visit these areas and get involved in the type of policies that may be used to overcome or prevent or even change the behaviours of those who are perpetrators of crime, and as well as looking at and examining and researching the victims and the trauma that they have experienced from this trauma, whether there have been any notable changes of those group of people compared to people who would not have experienced violence, and what would those life outcomes be like. Chris also shares with us why he got into this type of research, and the real reason why he did and I'll drop a clue here, it's because he met his future wife in an internet cafe in Nairobi who was doing similar type of work. And in this episode, we also have a conversation on Chris's cocaine gangland warfare in Colombia as as well as Chicago, and whether there would be any recommended policy to reduce such influence on these gangs in Colombia or regarding the mafia in Chicago. A number of questions I posed to Professor Blattman include what would happen to the land that is used to cultivate coca in Colombia and those people who are involved in that type of activity, whether they can pivot and change into other types of agricultural produce or perhaps even cannabis if used for medicinal purposes. So this is a very interesting episode with a very nice person, Chris Blattman, and he also shares with us some of his recommended books as well as his website, which is an Aladdin's cave of all types of research and writings by Professor Blattman over at chrisblattman.com. And you can check out all the links, books and resources mentioned in this episode over at economicrockstar.com forward slash Chris Blattman. That's B-L-A-T-T-M-A-N. And if this is an episode that interests you, well, why not check out two other previous episodes from the Economic Rockstar podcast catalogue, which I recommend you should, which are episode 55 with David Scarbeck on the economics of prison gangs and the social order of the underworld, and episode 101 with Chris Coyne on the opportunity cost of war, exporting democracy and the nirvana fallacy. And there's a lot more in the catalogue over at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your weekly downloads. 
Again, if you would like to financially support the podcast, check out patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar where you can support the podcast for as little as $1 per month or and whatever suits your budget. I'd like to give a shout out to Professor Maria Mora, who is this week's supporter of the Economic Rockstar podcast based on our contribution on Patreon. Thank you so much for your generous contribution, Maria. And Maria has previously featured on the podcast in episode 145, where she discusses Puerto Rican socioeconomic outcomes in the US and the AEA mentoring program. So thanks, as always, for listening and enjoy this episode with Professor Chris Blattman. One fairly common thing, counterintuitive, somewhat surprising, but really widely documented now, is that exposure to traumatic experiences often leads people to become more socially oriented, more cooperative, more engaged in their communities. And and so there are some, you know, there is a silver lining to this dark cloud. Hello, Chris. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm oh, very good. Thanks very much for taking time out and for being patient with me, given the mix up last week. No problem. No problem. Do you have any questions that you'd like to ask before we move on, Chris? Uh, yeah. So you can, I mean, I know we chatted about this. I've just been running around like a madman today. <laughs> I was going to look it up. So can you tell me a bit more about the podcast? Uh, I, 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 it's just more that it slipped my mind from when we discussed by email. Yeah. Do, do you want to know the history? Who's like examples of people who've been on it and that as a. Yeah, or what, and, and that's fine, but I mean, also what your, what, like, your audience is like, I, I, whether it's what, what you're trying to do in terms of level of technicality or, or things of that nature. Yeah, I, was, I started in late November 2014. I think I caught in touch with you around then, maybe early 2015 mm-hmm. was my first point of contact with you. Um, mm-hmm. number of guests, I've had some Nobel laureates, and then mm-hmm. there's a mix of, disciplines or expertise within that such as behavioral economists mm-hmm. so we, we i try to touch on all aspects in an unbiased manner so i neither libertarian or keynesian or monetarist so i'm trying to uh, yeah. have conversations that are quite meaningful regarding not necessarily what's going on in the world at the moment but more so regarding the research that my guest is carrying out or a book that's been recently published because so, usually what happens when people are, and you know this, when people are introduced to economics and maybe all they know about economics initially is they assume it's about money or they're locked into the, the typical principles that are bound within a particular textbook. And it's only when mm-hmm. they move on and specialize or they go to university like the one you're in now that they're introduced to different topics such as what you're doing on war and conflict and order mm-hmm. and what you know so i don't have that in my university i was never really exposed to it as a student and i think it's a great platform for me to be able to provide listeners who are neither who could be economists they could be students at that not that they could be they are economists they are students of economics or there are people who have an interest in economics but has never uh, got a chance to study or are considering studying it. And these people have got in touch with me and mentioning that pretty much what I've just said to you there is a great eye opener and it's a great, it's a good platform to okay, be exposed to this sense. type of stuff. So in terms of my ambition for it or the reason why I'm doing it, I suppose not that I, I just wanted to. I suppose I did want to build up a platform. I did want to do something like this in economics mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. finance. It wasn't my initial thought a podcast was going to be on, but when I stumbled into it and kind of got the ball rolling, really, it, it's been a weekly podcast. So really, it's kind of developed to where it is now. And at the moment, it's just audio only with a, mm-hmm. a blog that provides links, such as the ones I'm going to put up on stuff that we're going to talk about today. So Mm -hmm. any book recommendations, your own blog post, some of your research, and I link it to your website. And if people use my website as a means to get yours, getting to yours, you know, I'm happy with that. You know, I'm just providing a link, not that they need to uh, go through mine, but if they haven't come across your work before, they might be able to navigate through my website. And yeah, great. Okay. 
Yeah. And then, and broadly, what kinds of, uh, I mean, what, what, what parts of the research agenda did you want to talk about? I mean, it may be, I could also in a minute just tell you some of the things so that you're aware that are probably not as, not that they're not public knowledge, but because they're sort of have been ongoing, there's not, there's no sort of much, there's not much record of me working on them, but they're sort of themes I could at least give you advance warning of if you wanted to cover them. Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, I know when I first came across your work a number of years ago, I, I know I did up this poster on Mission Impossible and I kind of changed the, I think it was Tom Cruise and I changed it to your name and kind of created a, <laughs> oh some goodness. kind of a, a meme. I don't know if you remember that. I think you liked that on do. Twitter I or something. That, yeah, exactly. That was a while ago. Okay. Yeah, I so, remember. That was funny. So it was just like from that, it was like violence and war and conflict and that's the theme that's running through my mind when I um, mm-hmm. think of you. So definitely, if there's something else there that you're doing at the moment, it's great. It's all generally in that theme. I mean, the 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 most recent, yeah, the problem with the most recent published work is it's research that's like four years old in terms yes. of my participation in it, like the Liberia work on cognitive behavior therapy and violence reduction. So I would say the the basically the new projects I've been working on uh, in in Colombia, partly on policing and basically ways to reduce crime and violence through sort of routine city services. But I've also been uh, studying how gangs operate and mafias operate and then trying to think about new intervention design. I mean, no one's ever really been able to test interventions. There's been, never been any experimentation, at least formal experimentation, with anti-gang anti-mafia interventions and we're we're starting to do that we've got one underway and then we're also doing something here in chicago that's related to the liberia work and that involves employment and cognitive behavior therapy it's sort of turning off the most violent offenders but um but then again starting to also try to think about what are the rather than what what are the sort of mm, what the, how do you go up a level from the individual to the actual organized unit of crime and think about what kinds of theories are driving its behavior and and then how you might how you might use policy to to reduce their influence so that's i'd say that's been what's taking up most of my time yeah uh, in addition to and then trying to write a book on all of this but that's that's my goodness it, it'll be a year before i have if if i if i have a finished draft in a year it'll be It'll be a miracle. Well, given the amount of work that you do based on, like when I went into your website, it was like an Aladdin's cave of work. You know, there's so much there, research blogs. Personally, I don't know how you do it, to be honest. And as I would do, I'd I'd read up on some of the work uh, in advance of a a podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't do it as intensely as I had done before because... I prefer to have the natural flow of a conversation, and if something right. comes up, I'd like to be able to latch onto that point, uh, you know, to develop that yep. point for, further. But when I was looking through your website earlier on, one of the um, posts that I saw was the best book I ever read this year, or the best book I read this year, and it was, mm-hmm. it's called My Struggle Book to a Man in Love by Carl Ove Nosgaard, I think. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. And... I said, right, I must have a read of that post. It's a short post, but there's an excerpt from it. I don't know whether it's an excerpt from a book or whether it was a quote. It must have been an excerpt from his, his book. Yeah, he's quite a, he's quite a powerful writer. Yeah. And it's like, I think any man who's any, any man or female, but this is coming from a perspective of a father, isn't it? Mm-hmm. With children and any, any saying that light or, not that life gets in the way, but when he has ambition to be creative or to yep. write books, it's, it becomes very difficult, hence the name My Struggle. And I think there's six yeah. books there. And mm-hmm. I related to it. And it's something that you just alluded to there when you said, if you get the book done within a year, it'll be a miracle. Yep. Is this something you struggle personally with or do you put pressure on yourself? Because I do that a lot. <laughs> oh, no, we all have. I mean, yeah, that's I, mean, I, I don't if you don't have that pressure on yourself then i don't think any of these things happen this is the only way it, it, you just require a lot of self-motivation to to write a book or or you need i guess a book contract with a looming deadline which i which i have not given myself yet but i think i'm going to need to give that to myself soon to also provide some external motivation 
that's it I think deadlines I, I spoke about that with somebody recently and it's the mm-hmm. deadlines that really get you to complete the work when the pressure is on sometimes right. I wonder how students actually do the papers that they do but it's when that deadline is due yeah. that due date they get it done exactly Professor Blattman welcome to the Economic Rockstar podcast thanks for having me I'm really honoured to have you on the show. It's something that I was looking forward to for a number of years, to be honest. And I'd love to be able to talk to you about your work on crime and violence and any work that you're doing to date. Great. Firstly, I'd love to, I suppose, ease into the conversation by asking you, how did you get into this line of work? Do you mean, did, how did I get into academia or how did I get into the line of work and sort of on violence? I suppose on violence, but... I sp- let, let's let's go back a step and find out how you got into academia, and then was there something there that triggered your decision to research on violence? Well, I guess in terms of academics, I I was probably an undergraduate, and uh, in my third or fourth year of university, having been more of a, a business degree uh, and doing a lot of practicalities and and not really enjoying it and not having engaged you know as many sort of intellectually rewarding courses as maybe a lot of people would get in university it was much more of a almost a trade like degree and and then deciding i didn't want to do that realizing i wasn't very good at the business aspect i wasn't really enjoying it and and i switched my major and i basically started taking just a lot of political science and economics classes and it sort of opened up this – it was the first time I'd been excited about something in a long time. And I thought, well, I, how do I keep doing this? At the same time that I became really interested in issues of international poverty and inequality, that, that was what really called to me. And so I I had – that you know, I, I had this aspiration then to, to try out academia. It would be a few years. I was still on this track. I had a job offer from a consulting firm in Toronto. So I still went there and I worked there for a couple of years. But I – Almost from the day I started at that job, I knew it was. I was just biding my time to, to get basically the, the the requirements I needed to to be able to, to change paths. But you weren't exposed to much in terms of say economics and your undergrad level. Well, not until I switched. Not, I mean, I, I switched into an economics major, and then I think for my fourth year of university, I did uh, eight economics classes so that I could I could qualify for the major without staying too much longer. And so, so at that point, I became very. It was a funny department. It's called the University of Waterloo, and at the time, I think now it's a much more normalized department. But at the time, it was about fifty percent Marxists, and about fifty percent uh, very sort of right wing, almost uh, I think what they would call it, real business cycle analysts and analysis, and 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 a number of so so sort of half libertarian and half Marxist. <laughs> And so nothing in between. And so it was, it was sort of, it was actually a, a really intellectually interesting place to be. But, but I didn't, I, did, I learned very few little in terms of normal economics. And then did you happen to do some research and then was exposed to certain elements of the research that you're doing at the moment? Well, I, I, so I initially I, I took a master's degree in public policy and I, and a, and a professor of mine sent me to India to work on some information technology and development related topics. So we were, they were rolling out. The idea was to run a randomized trial of bringing the internet to rural villages for the first time, which was something you could do in 2000 or 2001 when most of the planet didn't have any internet. And so, uh, and it was actually being delivered by radio waves. Uh, and so we were, and, and that was a colossal failure, that experiment more for logistical and, and other reasons, but it was, it was educational. And I, I kind of got the bug. It was my first time in a developing country working at least. And, and, uh, and I just became fascinated with the issues and I, and I went to a PhD in economics and I got hired to go work on a health and development experiment in Kenya. Uh, I'd never given much thought to violence or any of the issues around violence at all. Really. Uh, what happened is I was in a very slow internet cafe in Nairobi and I sat down next to uh, a woman, and, and it took our you know, Hotmail pages 10 minutes to load up between emails, and so we started chatting. And she was – turned out she was a humanitarian worker and, and PhD student as well who was coming back from South Sudan in northern Uganda where she'd been working with children affected by war. And we began talking, and uh, one thing led to another, and about – Six or eight months later, I followed her to northern Uganda, where we ended up 
starting a uh, we started a research project together on on the impacts of war on children and the long run impacts of being a child soldier. Uh, I saw I, I, I sort of very unexpectedly, uh, f- basically because of this sort of one week affair in Nairobi, found myself uh, all of a sudden studying conflict and in a conflict zone and and um, learning very quickly. And now uh, uh, we've been married ten years. We have two kids, <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a, it was a very productive. Thank goodness for slow internet in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, in, in addition to our jobs and research careers. Well, just as well there weren't any smartphones back then. Yeah, exactly. You could have missed the exactly. boat. But that was very uh, mature at the time for two PhD students to up sticks and go to. It was it Northern Uganda? You said. Well, she'd been a she'd been a humanitarian worker there full time for two years. Uh, I guess from two thousand two thousand two, which was the height of the conflict when it was very dangerous to be there, uh, delivering services. She was working in schools and. And then she wanting to sort of recognizing how much uh, there's all these kids affected by vi- affected by violence or coming back from a, a brief or a very long conscription or abduction by the rebel group. And so what do you do for these kids was her question. And so she ended up uh, deciding to go into a psychology PhD to be able to answer this and would come back and forth each year to spend some time doing the research and helping to develop programs and uh, I, when we met, basically the way an economist could, could, could enter in here is, is, is that, the, you know, this is, there's, there's very little data uh, on this. So just how do you, how do you collect reliable data? Um, and then, you know, the, I suppose the, the important part from the perspective of someone who does, who's more of an applied statistician like me is that it seemed that the people, like the exposure to violence and in particular the act of conscription by the rebel group, looked pretty idiosyncratic or at least you know after you account for a few things like the the child's age or some aspects of the location or maybe some aspects of the household children who are abducted and children who are not it was it was it was sort of a quasi random act or so was the the argument and if you and if you take that then you can actually follow we what we did is we followed kids 10 or 15 years after exposure to these acts and we were able to say so if we believe that this is sort of conditional on all these things it's almost a random event of who's abducted and who's not or who's exposed to this violence and who's not then we can say what is the long-run impact of this exposure on your labor market performance on how much education you obtain on long-run psychological trauma uh symptoms of distress and how does this affect your long-run social relationships and political behavior so there there was a lot of because because if you don't know the answer to that then you you probably are designing programs and policies and treatments in the wrong way. So an example is that if you if you think that everyone's traumatized by these terrible experiences, and th- these were really some of the most horrendous experiences one one could imagine, then you want a you want a system of really broad based psychological treatment in the long run and, and availability of counseling, which is which is a big ask in a place most most many post war places in in africa many many non war torn places in africa have virtually no psychologists uh and and actually what we found is something that was i, I don't think it's shocking if you're a psychologist but wasn't well established which is that most people recover on their own fairly well there's a relatively modest number of people who continue to experience very strong symptoms i mean this is a it's a pretty terrible experience no matter what, but relatively few people experience debilitating symptoms of distress that really interfere with their ability to get married or get a job or, or go on in life. And so if that's the case, then that now, now you need a very different approach. You need to – a hyper-targeted approach. You need a way to quickly diagnose who are these extreme cases and then deliver very targeted services. And, and so that's an example of how – I think the research we did started to change the way people were trying to deliver some kind of relief and recovery uh, after this war. And how did those children get on afterwards? Did they pretty much fit into society like any other kid growing up? And did they do it just as well as anyone else? Or were there extreme yeah. players from the rest of the population? Well, it's important to remember, and not every war is like this, but that the whole society was so wholly and completely disrupted by war and and so nobody nobody had a family that was, nobody had a family nobody's family was immune from this conflict. So it's sort of like World War II, uh, 
or World War One in the West. Like it was this all-consuming war, and every family somebody fought or somebody died, and so it was this shared experience. And so, and this is important because it might be very different when a very small percentage of the population is exposed to a trauma and comes back to a, a society that maybe where nobody understands. And and so, basically, they they get on in the. I guess the maybe the big conclusion is is that this was an economically devastating event for most families and and that is some way in that some ways it's paramount in most people's minds as to what they see as the problem that that they had a set of opportunities that were crushed because of this war that not only robbed them of their chance to earn a livelihood but then if they had some terrible act of violence or rebels looted their home or rebels kidnapped them for a number of years that ended their schooling or that eliminated their entire asset stock like their cows or that destroyed their houses or that led to the burning down of their fields and so there's this enormous economic setback and that almost consumed their attention even at the moment when we were talking to them years afterwards more than any of the, the psychological trauma which is of course still important and so because they, they want to feed their kids and they want to get on in life and they want to have more than one or two meals a day and they want their kids to be able to go to a school and and so forth and so so this was prob so so they're getting on but it was mostly an economic setback and so it, in many ways it looks like people who were they're, they're not that different from people who were exposed to some nonviolent disaster and then the aspect of violence you know i suppose one of the things that there are these you know most people live with some very painful memories some people have have sort of are debilitated by this but what was interesting and one of the unexpected things we found and subsequently it's been found in dozens of other places affected by violence is the people who are expected to exposed to more violence are actually more politically and socially active later in life so at least within their own group and society and, and villages one fairly common thing counterintuitive somewhat surprising but really widely documented now is that exposure to traumatic experiences often leads people to become more socially oriented more cooperative more engaged in their communities and and so there are some you know there is a silver lining to this dark cloud so obviously with the silver lining their engagement in society is a positive thing it wouldn't be somebody who is trying to get back at society and put on mm -hmm. the, the negative experiences that they had earlier on in life. Well, it's, it's, it's a good point. You know, the Nazi movement was a social movement. Uh, and, and it was a social movement that was privileging one ethnic group over another and one set of ideas over another. So, so there are, so, so, so internal cohesion and cooperation in a group can also be used for ill. So I don't want it. I don't want us to think that a social cohesion and group cooperation is always and everywhere a good thing, because sometimes these these can be used for uh, for ill. And so I, you know, I, I so I guess every circumstance is different. My sense is, on average, in most societies, this cohesion is actually strengthening that society, and and there are many more non-Nazi movements than there are Nazi movements, but. But yeah, you know, it's it's it it can be uh, it it's not it's you know there there are unexpected consequences always. Chris, you've done some other research as well on crime in developing countries. Not you know, I, I suppose we, we'll talk about Colombia soon. But it's just that in a recent podcast episode, I only copped on there in episode one forty eight with Tom W. Bell. We talked about special economic zones, and mm -hmm. one example was Honduras which has mm -hmm. a particularly high crime rate. And my question was, I mean, we couldn't find an answer. Maybe you'll be able to tell us this if you have any other examples of areas like special economic zones that you might have been exposed to. But would crime rates be relatively low in certain areas compared to those other towns or cities outside of these zones? Uh I don't have a lot of direct experience. You know, I've hung out a couple in a couple of special economic zones in very different places, like Kenya and Ethiopia. I haven't spent very much time in Central America. I, I mean, I would say one thing that seems to be very common, certainly in the U.S., where there's the most data, but also globally, is crime does tend to be fairly concentrated in in certain locales. 
And, and that's maybe because of the features of that locale. It's probably even more so because of the people who get involved and sort of the, you know, just like there's a, you know, there's streets in New York where all the diamond traders have their shops and where all the kitchen sales people have their shops and this and that. Like there's, 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 there's sort of agglomerations that, that have advantages for, for those, those people who take place in that, take part in that trade. And, and so crime is, is in some respects no different. So if you look at your average U.S. city, this is also true in Colombia. I'd probably, I'd hazard a guess it's also true in Honduras is that, the, you know, most of the crime is happening in a relatively small number of places. And, you know, especially economic zones are probably lots of features that are not too conducive to crime. And so I, it wouldn't surprise me if that happened to be one of the places where crime was generally pretty low. But it's more the application of a general set of patterns rather than any specific knowledge of Honduras or especially economic zones. Chris, the approach you take to research is seems to be your field studies, like the way you set up that research group with your now wife. Mm-hmm. How is it, like, do you feel any way, you know, you talk about psychological treatment and all that. Do you Have you been exposed to certain traumas in some countries where your research has actually taken you to, or even, mm-hmm. not, not even physical or verbal, but even listening to those people who have, experienced the, the trauma and that could have a certain effect on you. And how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, um, I haven't had, you know, fortunately I haven't really ever been in a, a very unsafe situation myself. You know, to be honest, I don't, you know, the, I, I wouldn't work somewhere that's extremely dangerous. It's, it's not really clear that it's worth putting myself at risk, let alone, you know, I, have, I, I need to hire huge teams to run these studies. So very seldom am I comfortable putting other people at risk. I don't want to hire a local or international research assistant to put themselves in a situation of risk. So for that, I don't work generally in Iraq or Afghanistan or, or maybe, you know, the, the corner of Nigeria where Boko Haram is, which I, which I do think are genuinely di- like dangerous places to do research. The places where I'm working like South side of Chicago or, managing Colombia or war, post-war areas in Uganda or Liberia, for example, were always, they weren't, they weren't um, danger free, but they're perhaps no more dangerous than working in a very, in in a high crime part of town in any city in the world that has these problems. Uh, And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't see my work in Southside Chicago as any more dangerous than Northern Uganda during the war. But, but I think you raise a good point, which is that, Hearing these secondhand stories often, you know, a lot of my prior to doing more of the quantitative work or running experimental interventions, I, I tend to spend a lot, a lot of time. This was true in Northern Uganda and Liberia is true now in Chicago and Colombia, just talking to a lot of people. Uh, sometimes they're victims more often in recent years. They've been perpetrators. I haven't found it traumatizing. It's, it's very difficult to process sometimes. I think you become you do become accustomed to it after a while, which has its own, in some sense that can be frightening in itself. You have to sometimes remind yourself that these are, yeah, you have to sort of keep yourself from getting desensitized is, is perhaps more important than protecting yourself from trauma. Because once you've heard someone talk about like a a rebel abduction or a gang shooting of their, of their relative or of themselves, for the 20th time you begin to think, Oh, this sounds very familiar. I'm not really learning anything new. And, and that's a very callous reaction. It's a, it's a natural reaction, but it's a callous one. And so I think protecting myself from callousness is maybe even more important than protecting from trauma. I suppose it's important for research as well. When you're doing, doing your work that you, you protect yourself from that. And also the, the emotional aspect of it as well. If you wouldn't want to have it necessarily play into the writing of your report yeah it's a tough i mean if anything a lot of if you go to an academic conference that's touching on something to do with war violence you will see people who are very detached even those of us who are not that detached from the situation presenting these horrifically you know they'll code some act like rebel conscription or torture or something into a a variable and they'll be analyzing and this is useful this is important but but then you'll have like this entire academic conference debating these things in a very detached academic way with all the right 
you know, with, 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 a, with a set of, you know, the, the outcome of this is good. It's important to make progress on this. But then you can sort of step back and realize just how shocking and ridiculous it is, ridiculous it is that you could talk about these things in such dispassionate terms and worry about, you know, spend more time worrying about standard errors than you do about maybe some of the substantive things that are going on. So, you know, you have to be able to balance both. And so when I try to write, I try to make it a little bit, I try to err on the side of being, um, of, of, of giving people a sense of, of that, of this, of, of more of the human aspect of it when I can, as much as one does in say an economics journal, journal article, which is not much, but certainly in the presentations and, and using a lot of photography and, and I've, I've, I've often maybe gone too far. I, I remember when I did my practice talk for my job talk when I was going, when I was first going on the job market as I was finishing my PhD and, and literally moved one of the professors in my, Unwittingly, but literally moved one of the professors in my seminar to tears. And, you know, people were like, this is great. But, you know, I actually had to learn to dial dial some of it back because I forget that other people are not desensitized to some of these things in the same ways that I may have become. I guess it's the same in the medical profession as well. They may appear somewhat desensitized, but it's the profession, the professional approach to their work and likewise to your work as well. Um, your research now currently is gone into Latin America to Colombia. Mm-hmm. And I guess with any natural resource, I don't know if it's coming from this, but any natural resource like oil, it, there tends to be some conflict in Colombia. You have the opiate trade or drugs and then there's a lot of gang warfare. This is maybe incorrect for me to say something like this, but mm-hmm. it's the perception that is put out there when we hear about some Latin American countries like Colombia. And uh, why did you draw attention toward Colombia? And what is your research, uh, ongoing research on this country? Right. So I, I've, I spent five years working in northern Uganda. I still have some involvement there, but I, I, I was really intensely focused there for five years. And I was in, closely focused on working in Liberia for five years. And at that point, I was looking for somewhere new to work. I think I, to the, I wanted to understand perpetrators. I wanted to understand more organized armed groups. And actually, the two places I was working, Uganda and Liberia, were not very good places to study that, in part because the groups weren't particularly organized and, and in part because they were becoming very successful examples of peace and stabilization. And so that's a terrific thing for the world that that's not a good thing for my research. And so I, disappointment for you. <laughs> well, I, I did, I did have to sort of look, I, I had to say, well, I need to sort of move to places where I think, where I think there's actually going to be a lot of organized armed groups for a while, because mm-hmm. otherwise what else, you know? And so um, at the same time, I have young children now and, and, and trying to do field work while having young children is tricky. You have less time. So things that aren't, as far away or thing, places you can bring your family are very important. And so, so to be quite honest, I started saying, well, where are the places where that I have, you know, what are the very violent countries in the world with organized armed groups where I can also bring my family? And this becomes a very <laughs> short list. Uh, and, I can't believe you're so, saying, I'm hearing this. <laughs> so that was actually, but you know, this is, this is cause most of the, and my wife runs the research department for a large humanitarian organization and she can't, we can't bring the family most of those places like Congo. You're not going to bring your kid maybe to Kinshasa, but that's not where you need to be working. Yeah. So I think it came down to, 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 to sort of the Syria region, like Jordan, Lebanon, Colombia, um, Mexico, and Indonesia, and maybe Kenya. And so I actually did exploratory trips. I spent a couple, two or three weeks in Kenya looking for ideas. And I, then I spent a few weeks in Colombia and I was going to do a sort of a tour of each of these places and seeing which ones seemed to be promising and where opportunities would can't come up in Colombia within weeks of being there, just developing relationships and colleagues and ideas and uh, just a whole bunch of things flourished. And so I never, I've actually started to just only after like three years later, I'm only now starting to continue my tour of alternative places from the perspective of long-term project building and trying to understand this. So I'm starting some things in India. I might spend some of the summer in Jordan, but, uh, but I'm spending most of my time in Colombia these days when I'm not in the country. And so, yeah, it was this, it's a, it's sort of a, it's a peculiar kind of calculus for finding field sites. So when you, when you're looking for these field sites within Colombia, so you've narrowed it Mm -hmm. down to a country, you have to maybe go into a city and an area within that. Do you approach gang members or mafia members is there how do you build trust uh, there 
Right. Well, no, I mean, uh, every place is going to be different. The luxury that I enjoyed or the advantage I enjoyed in Colombia is there's an incredibly well-developed academic and policy community. I mean, in many ways, it's a developed country. Uh, certainly the cities are, are, are extremely high income and high levels of education, really capable collaborators, both in the policy and the academic space. And so uh, I started off by building a few lucky relationships with some fabulous local academics, both a couple of professors and some PhD students where we had shared interests. And then in one case, one of those professors, Daniel Mejia, who I, I, I sort of hit, hit it off with right away, six months later was asked to leave academia to become uh, essentially the head of security for the a, a deputy mayor like position for the city of Bogota to be in charge of security. So in, in the U.S., this would be like a, a, a chief of police kind of position, mm -hmm. except it's a civilian, not a not a police or military position in his case or in, in the case of Colombia. And so that opened up a ton of opportunities where he said, all right, we let's do some ambitious things. And at the same time, he also said, I need you to take my students because I can't, I need someone to advise them because I won't be able to do this anymore. And one of them, a guy named Santiago Tobón was, we just hit it off fabulously. And he's from the second city in Medellin. And we decided to just go hang out in Medellin for a week together and talk to government officials and talk to things and, 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 and try to figure out how things work. And within days of being there, realized it was totally different than a place like Bogota where there's very little organized crime. It's a very peaceful city in many ways. But Medellin has a set of very well-organized gangs and cartels. So there's hundreds of street gangs at the local level that uh, tightly control local territory, uh, tightly control those communities. They regulate a lot of the, the legal markets. And in addition to running the illicit markets, they, they play a role in governing the communities. So if you... You know, if you need a dispute resolved, if you have a, uh, you know, you go to the, the gang, they're called combos. You go to the combo and not the, the police, probably. If you have a noise complaint, you probably go to the combo. The combo is probably doing more day-to-day -day policing than than the actual police and so forth. So, uh, uh, and, it, and, and then we spent, we, this was so fascinating to us, we then had to spend weeks trying to figure out in months and months, we've basically spent the last two years just trying to figure out how it works. So we've, we're now running some uh, experimental interventions with the city government where we identified really promising interventions to counter gang rule in these neighborhoods. But that was the product of a still ongoing one or two year. You know, you don't mess around in that kind of situation without mm -hmm. knowing how things work. And nobody, even someone like Santiago, who is from Medellin, who's a crime expert, who's had run a lot of projects in Medellin, really had any idea what was going on. Nobody does. You have to sort of dig. There's only a few people who really understand it. And so we've built this team of me and Santiago and a couple of ethnographers where very slowly we were able to build the relationships, not just with the police and civil society in the neighborhoods, but also realizing that a lot of the gang and mafia leaders will talk, especially the ones in prison. And so we've been interviewing them and studying the whole armed organization of the entire city and the whole network of interactions at these combo level and the mafia level and the interactions with the government and the legitimate private sector. And so it's just that whole ecosystem and trying to bring sort of an economic and political theoretical lens to it. Um, what that turns into, I'm not sure, but that that's kind of what it took to be able to intervene, I think, intelligently and responsibly. So the, the organized crime or the organized gangs, I suppose, in Colombia, is it just mm -hmm. one gang and then you have your your police or are there a number of gangs there? Because, as you said, if there was a noise complaint, you go to, who did right. you say it was beginning with C? Uh, the, the combo. The com you go to the combo and it's, mm -hmm. it's just a combo. There's no other, or maybe there's smaller pockets. So where you live, there's just one combo. Okay. It's probably been that combo's territory for a very long time, maybe decades. Okay. Some of these are very old organizations. Sometimes maybe two thirds of neighborhoods in Medellin have a have a combo that that control that territory. That's basically all the low income and a majority of the middle income neighborhoods, and and they're a very real presence. And I'd say many of them had these combos ten or twenty or thirty years ago uh, or longer. Some they're relatively new arrivals because they, this is profitable. They expand their territory. They're imitators. But and so and there may be two. We don't. Nobody really knows. There's somewhere between 150 and maybe 250 more if you go beyond the metro. If you sort of think of the full metro area, which is 
as always, like relatively expansive. They're starting to organize some of the rural communities as well. And then on top of that, there's this layer of maybe 12 mafias. But those 12 mafias are not generally very competing. They're actually organized in a confederation that they call the office or La Oficina. And so you you can think of this as a, one of the – every every group of gangs and criminal organizations and mafias in the world in any city would have loved to have this level of vertical integration and, and they keep the peace. And, 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 and there's, there's relatively little violence in Medellin because it's so centrally organized and coordinated. And they've managed to solve a set of problems that most criminal organizations, there aren't mafia wars and gang wars uh, or haven't been until recently to the same extent in Medellin as there have been in, in a lot of other parts of the world because they've managed to, you know, solve the kinds of problems that gangs and mafias didn't solve in Chicago or New York or Nairobi or other cities. There must be a, a, a pretty decent code then, a code of respect or something amongst these people and the, the combo. And mm-hmm. I, I, and I'm sure you're doing some comparisons with those gangs in Chicago, but just mm-hmm. to um, maybe get back to that soon, but given that Colombia shares the same border as Venezuela, have you yeah. been, are you interested in seeing what's going on in Venezuela in terms of the two almost opposite types of the way the states are run? One is yeah. a dictatorship. Is Colombia a democracy or would mm-hmm. you say, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Colombia has been trending towards becoming a much more vibrant and open and free and less corrupt democracy over time. 20, 30 years ago, it was, um, either, I think there's a lot more cartel and drug money and involvement in, in politics. It's still there to a degree, but I think it's increasingly independent of that. And, and, and so it's, it's quite a, a thriving place. Venezuela has been moving in the opposite direction. I would say the I, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about or studying Venezuela. I mean, it's a different case. The, I think the terrain, it's not very mountainous, which I which I believe is one of the main reasons there's very little coca production, unlike Colombia, where I think the this was one of the places where very early on you saw an explosion of coca production. We're now talking, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, I think maybe 40 years ago, well, maybe a little bit more, maybe 50 years ago. And so – that that it's that full chain from production and 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 processing and transshipment that sort of gave a lot of armed groups in Colombia their start and they were allowed to consolidate in the absence of a lot of state control so you don't have that whole part of the chain in in Venezuela and that's that's lucky for Venezuela unfortunately i think the presence of oil the centralization of political power allowed it to get hijacked partly by, you know, a set of special interests who wanted to harness oil money. It's, it's, it's been captured as a, a, I believe as a transshipment. Basically a lot of the military is heavily involved in the drug, drug trade, mainly through shipment because there's no production and, and have used the, the funds from oil and, and drugs, which don't care if there's a millions of people protesting on the street. Um, they, they, you know, whereas, whereas Colombia has to worry about that a little bit more. It has, it has some minerals and, and oil that it, that, that make it a bit immune from, from mass movements, but it, it actually depends on its civilians to sort of collect revenues. And so, so I think that's maybe what separates Venezuela plus a set of bad luck and historical circumstances, which I'm not in the best position to, uh, to lecture on. I know it's quite ironic to say this, but would the Colombian, ma- Colombian mafia be more into social responsibility. Uh, well, I mean, very often they they are and they're not. I mean, you know, if you get up, if you're a rebel leader or a mafia leader, and I've talked to some of these people at length from time to time, you do need, you know, you're not, you, you need, you, you don't get up in the morning and and think about what a wonderful, selfish, evil super genius you are, right? You need a way to rationalize why you too are a good person. We all need a narrative by why we're doing something that is correct. So the, the, you have to sort of put yourself in the perspective of how do they rationalize what they're doing? And partly sometimes it's a, sometimes they think that they are protecting like a, a family or a kin network. I mean, in some, the dominant mode of any kind of political organization in human history is essentially around your kin network and you take care of your kin and, 
non-kin or worth nothing to you, and it's a competition between kin groups. And so that's very normal way to organize things. There's a little bit of that in Colombia. Uh, it's actually more – they style themselves as right-wing defenders of – of liberty, essentially, from leftist communist forces. So you had the FARC guerrilla movement, you have several left-wing guerrilla movements, you had urban militias, you had... They sort of see Colombia potentially going down the route of uh, Venezuela and this move into sort of socialist autocracy, uh, which isn't, I think, a realistic fear right now, but 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 they, they were fighting on that, on the anti- leftist anti guerrilla side. And so they kind of style themselves in this sort of they're they're basically fighting for the for for maybe not democracy and freedom, but they're fighting for for this this more capitalistic system uh against this leftist control of the country. And so um as part of that, some of what they do is social but governing the neighborhood is is part of that. And and I'd say governing the neighborhood is also helping them say, listen, like the government's failed to provide services here. The government doesn't make these people's lives better. People need order and justice. And we're going to be the providers of order and justice. And it's a pain. It's expensive. We don't like doing this, but we need to do it to make money. And also it gives us a sense of purpose and it gives us our local legitimacy. And and that's, that's maybe the right way to think about them. It almost sounds like your earlier description of the University of Waterloo. When you were saying about <laughs> the, the Marxists and the left, <laughs> that's so true. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I mean, but this was this was this is what the last the latter half of the 20th century, right? And all of these a lot of these guys are are in their 60s, <clears throat> and uh, at least the leaders. And you know, this was the big. There was an ideological fight. There was a fight for what's the system by which we are going to govern our economies and the system by which we're going to govern our societies. And it was, it was a big brutal fight and it went on more violently and for a longer period in some places than others, it got tied up in the drug trade in, in Colombia, which was one of the things that allowed it to persist for so long. And so these guys are still fighting that battle in their own mind. At the same time, they know it's over, you know, with the peace in Colombia, what you're seeing now, there's actually a law um, going through Congress about, how, okay, you know, how to, how to, how to sort of create a, a peace process, or I wouldn't say a peace process, but a submission to justice by armed groups. And so, okay, we brought the FARC in, which is this long running guerrilla group that's been around for more than a half century. We're in the process of bringing in a couple of the other long running small political guerrilla groups like the ELN. But now we have these former paramilitary metamorphosized into criminal drug cartels and city mafias and how do we try to weaken them and basically provide a way for them to give them some incentives to basically turn themselves in and see if we can have this sort of economic peace process with the criminals rather than just a political peace process with the with the rebels and do they have any way of modeling this approach, this intervention approach on other examples? Or is what happened with the Chicago Mafia too long away or totally different mm-hmm. experiment? Or not, I wouldn't even say experiment, but uh, a totally different uh, scenario. It's a good question. Uh, you mean for this, this process of trying to get rid of the, for the political peace process and with the guerrilla, I mean, there's, Yes, you know, every situation is so different, but, but there have, there's been a lot, there's been a, I susp- I imagine they've very carefully looked at different cases and had a lot of international input and assistance and mediation. On the criminal side, there's not that many, uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not aware actually of many other examples. They're, they're in deeper than most places. I suppose if you think about the mafia in the U S in the decades after prohibition, which bears some resemblance to, you know, that, that was prohibition in the U S which outlawed alcohol production and sale was a map. As soon as you, as soon as you take any product in the world that people demand and you ban its sale and use, you have ceded an entire market to the black, you know, to the, to the, to the, to the black market. It's that, all of those transactions, there's an enormous demand for alcohol, or in this case, in the modern case, drugs. All of those markets demand mediation in some ways. Someone has to 
enforce contracts between buyers and sellers. Someone has to provide credit. Someone has to provide insurance. All of these sort of very basic things that we take for granted at every step of that production and marketing chain requires contracting between all sorts of parties. And uh, and there's a lot of profits to be made. And so government, sorry, organizations that are not the government that come in and are willing to use violence or coercion have a huge advantage because not only because they they can basically capture these profits if they provide if they sort of respond if they supply order in response to this demand for order. And so they regulate contracts, they regulate the trade, they provide credit, uh, they provide uh, insurance, and they they do all of these things that that smooth functioning free markets demand institutionally. And so when, when you, when you see this to, when you see marijuana production and sale or cocaine production and sale uh, or alcohol production and sale, you provide this huge opportunity for, for violent armed groups to rise up. And so this is what happened in the U S in prohibition. It took decades of sustained law enforcement, decades and decades before that has come down to a level in which I think the mafia are no longer a major factor in the economic and political life of most U.S. cities. Um, almost a century later, and and it'll be quite it'll be just that long in 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 Colombia, if if not longer. And so, but that's not you know saying you need to fight them through a sustained you know nationally coordinated law enforcement strategy for six decades isn't very helpful to a policymaker who needs to get reelected in four years. So they're often looking to much more you know, short-term solutions as well. I guess every place is unique anyway. You know, you had your prohibition <laughs> and that's what gave rise, I suppose, to give more power to the Chicago mafia. Um, in Ireland, I suppose Ireland is a, a unique case as well. And our president, Higgins, um, last year offered the Colombian president, President Santos, help in being a bridge between Colombia and the EU and rebuilding mm -hmm. or helping out with the peace process there because we had our own with Northern Ireland. Um, so we had the paramilitaries there in, our, in right. Northern Ireland who would be uh, similar to the FARC rebels in a way and in terms of the guerrilla warfare that ha is going on or had been going on quite recently in Colombia and more so in the 70s and 80s and uh, perhaps the early 90s in Ireland. So um, yep. I suppose there isn't one solution or one model that kind of fits all they have to be quite sensitive depending on the system that's built up like the hierarchy in the, the, the mafia in Colombia. It's very hard to break down unless you offer something to allow them to uh, disband in a way and yeah. let go really. And one thing, I mean, what's interesting is a lot of the, the, the politicians in Colombia, international human rights actors, major you know, UN organizations, mediators, everybody's on the same page and that they draw a very firm line between groups like the FARC in Colombia or the Irish Republican Army in, in, in Ireland as political movements. Uh, even though the FARC was in many ways a criminalized organization through the production and sale of drugs and where the criminal motives maybe began to overtake the political motives, not something that happens in many insurgencies, some t not, uh, not uncommon either, but they draw a really firm line between that and these criminalized drug cartels or mafias. And they do not want to ever give the talks with the criminal groups the legitimacy or the substance of a political set of negotiations. So you negotiate with the IRA, you negotiate with the FARC, but you don't negotiate, so to speak, with the criminal groups. And they try to drive a very hard line here because, it, it, you know, in spite of their aspirations to also – and sort of some of their little political motivations in these groups and what they use to rationalize, you don't want to – they try not to legitimate them or, or give them a sense that they can then become political actors. Uh, they try to – so they, 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 they're very careful. They call it like submission to justice processes. And then they have talks and negotiations on how they're going to submit. But it's – they try to keep it more in the realm of a plea bargain than a peace negotiation. But it's hard because, these, you know, it's, it's not an easy line to draw. Especially if you want, if they're if they're as powerful as they happen to be in Colombia. Yeah, like I, I just wonder how the the work that you're doing and creating, the, uh, identifying some intervention policies. You know that that can be quite difficult to do or to draw conclusions. Um, but it's it's a role we're taking and proceeding with. You know, if it means that. Colombia can move on and 
build up and as a country. But if if the trade, if Colombian trade is based on cocaine, say, mm-hmm. for these mafia gangs, and you know, the mafia gang disbands, which perhaps ends the cocaine trade, mm-hmm. what happens next? You know, does somebody else, are there other agricultural produce being uh, mm-hmm. produced there? Do you resort to cannabis if it's if the soil is amenable to su- such thing and mm-hmm. that could be used for uh, medical purposes? Right. What happens to these people? How do they become, re- how do they re-enter society through education or mm-hmm. labor? What happens next? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, on the one hand, I mean, but you, you, you're, you've stumbled across one thing that I think is really, really at odds with any kind of peace process. I mean, one of the things we've been trying to understand in sort of all these interviews and qualitatively studying these gangs is basically what's the set of economic and political, but what's the set of economic incentives that exist for these organizations to do what they're doing because they're meeting a set of demands for political order. They're meeting a set of demands for dispute resolution and contract enforcement, and they're meeting a set of demands for delivering a a, a narcotic, uh, which in this case is primarily coca and cocaine. So if you negotiate a, a surrender of, you know, let's say the, the largest cartel, one of the names they go by is the Clan de Golfo. If you negotiate the surrender of the Clan de Golfo, well, there's still thousands, if not tens of thousands of producers who are relatively poor. So these are the coca farmers. There's still millions of consumers in every country in the world, particularly in rich countries with a lot of money to spend for the end product. And you still have... Uh, and so, and, and, and then you still have organizations outside the country, like the Mexican cartels, which handle a lot of the, the, the transshipment by land. Um, and they want to find, they want to find local partners. So, so I think the, the big gap and the thing we've, and it's funny, you talk to these senior mafia leaders and they say, what we really want is this process of submission for justice. And then you say to them, like, listen, like, come on, this isn't like a peace process, like the FARC where you negotiate for a set of political concessions, which are legitimate and legal in some sense, and then you agree to ju- govern peacefully, you're, you're, running, you're, you're running extortion rings and you're running the drug trade. And so really, like, what's going to – there's there's still demand for these things. Like, someone's going to pick this up if you submit. How do you, how, do you, how do you meaningfully talk with the government about a submission process if – if you if you can't you know you can't actually turn this off this machine will can, there's lots of reasons for this machine to keep running and you sort of get a couple of answers one is a substantial number of these guys especially the middle ranking guys not not the high ranking guys haven't really thought that far down and you're like and and you realize you're the first person to tell them that this doesn't really like help that, that it doesn't necessarily make sense the other guys you might get like a chuckle and what they sort of realize is I think they're kind of just, they're like, this is kind of my way to get out. Me and my organization, we're going to submit and I'll keep most of the money I've earned and I'll go to jail for 10 years, but at least I can get out after 10 years and I'm legitimated and I can go live my life and I can spend this money is I think the, the average sort of logic. And I think the logic on the government side is partly that they always, they, they haven't necessarily thought this far ahead, some of them and others I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I, I, my, my speculation is that they think this might be a way to weaken the gangs well enough or the, the cartels and the drug trade enough to basically push production and transshipment to other countries. So basically have it move back to Ecuador where it, where it was for a little while uh, is probably their goal. Which, so, and, and, then what, and then if they can do that, then, then Colombian farmers could switch to corn or you know, they, 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 they try to provide soybeans or other things. And there, there's some incentives to do this. Right now, while that market exists, it's so much more profitable to do coca, even with the risks, uh, even with the mafias and the cartels sh- shaving off most of the profits, and even with the fact that there's some risk of a, of a crop spraying campaign that would just eradicate your whole crop for that season. I think the incentives there are, uh, yeah, so I, 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 unless they can shift the, the whole production and transshipment trade to another country, which is probably their plan, which isn't really a solution to the global problem. 
I don't really see much changing with the submission process. Chris, can you see beyond your work in Colombia or, or what's next on the radar? Well, um, I think the stuff in, I mean, in Medellin, we're, we're now at the point where we've got close enough relationships with the government that they're, and, and we understand things well enough that, that we're in a position to start suggesting interventions to say, get gangs out of governing and, and, or helping, you know, identifying really key members in these local gang networks and working on getting them to exit and thus maybe weakening all of the networks that that'll keep us busy for a while. And then I've started a project in Chicago on that's related in the sense of getting um, basically can't, it's at a lower level. It's thinking of, you can think of Chicago as a case where years of relatively successful law enforcement in the sense of arresting senior and middle leaders and disrupting organized gangs has turned uh, has basically led to the, the the crime being very disorganized um a lot of people especially even former gang members some of whom are social workers that i'm i'm working with now you know don't even regard what what exists in chicago today as gangs they, they, they sort of say, well, it's a clicks or cliques. And, and so it's more like little in more, you know, informal social and cooperative networks based on what block you're on. It's a much smaller group. It's not as well organized. And a lot of the drug selling and violence has escalated because it's less controlled. So the, the, the shootings in Chicago, which make national news and maybe international news are, are in some sense a product of the, they're not being higher level gang members or cartels that are tamping this down in order to keep business good. Cause it's good for nobody. It's, you know, it's not good for business. It's not good for the guys who get caught up in these cycles of vendettas. And so the thing I've been working on a bit is understanding how to characterize this. So what's actually going on, why is there violence? And then working with some civil society organizations in the city to identify the people who are most likely to commit violence in this disorganized fashion, the people who are either in the middle of a vendetta cycle or maybe potentially about to kick one off because say they're the, they're the shooter or enforcer for one of these, you know, little, again, not really a drug lane so much as it's like a, a little click as they, as they call it here. And, and then what do we do? How do we identify who these really high risk people are? So who are the thousand or 2000 people who are most likely to pull a trigger in the next year in Chicago and then thinking about interventions and testing out interventions that would actually dissuade them from violence. It sounds like you should be in the secret service. I thought you should remain <laughs> anonymous. It's like, it's like I, I talk I talk far too much to ever be in the secret service. That's what I was saying. If it was me, I'd be trying to remain anonymous. <laughs> it's like Mr. and Mrs. Smith, yourself and your wife. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, you know, there's this is a very crowded field. There's um. There, 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 you know, once you get into this area, I mean, there's enough violence and, you know, you get to a city like Chicago where, you know, a third or, or more of the population of the city lives in neighborhoods that are extremely violent by any normal standard. Yeah, there's thousands of people out there every day trying to uh, figure out a way to make the neighborhood more safe. And, and so maybe that it's actually the flip it's that there's relatively few academics especially economists there's a lot of in sociology and criminology there's a lot there's relative those of us who sort of dwell in our our, in our our whatever our silo is in this case economics there's relatively few people who engage on the it's it's so that's that's the thing it's actually given how big a problem this is globally um this is the major cause of death in a lot of countries in a lot of cities it's certainly the major cause of death for any young person in the u.s typically mm -hmm. Um, yeah, why, why, why is it exceptional to say, you know what, we need to understand how these organizations work. We need to understand the economic incentives. We need to be studying the interventions. And to do that effectively, we need to be going and spending a lot of time in these places to figure out how it all works and talking to these people and treat them like normal people. And what's interesting is when you talk to a rebel or a criminal, not always, you know, they're often very suspicious for good reason, but you can get a lot of answers. It's surprising. I'm not going to say it's surprisingly easy. I think you have to be very careful and very cautious and whatnot. But, but it's, but once you've built up some level of trust or involvement, you can, just, you can learn a lot. So, so it's such a big problem. You know, there's a lot more of us should be doing this and it's not, it's not a bridge too far for, for our profession. It's like, 
I don't know if you ever heard of Walter O'Brien. He's actually from Wexford in Ireland, where I was, where I'm from. But he has a company called Scorpion Computer Services. I think there's a mm-hmm. an epi- or a series called Scorpion named after him. But he works for the the U.S. military and NASA and so on, and he's based in the mm-hmm. U.S. at the moment. But it's like you should get in touch with him on how to dismantle gang crimes. And also on one of your bios, I think, of more of an informal bio, you mentioned that you had one of the best jobs in, in your early years as a rock climber instructor and a music store salesman. <laughs> and you're considered less cool ever since. But I don't know if people would agree with you on that. And how do your students uh, see you or perceive you when you come back with these stories through your, your research and your field study trips? And I shouldn't say trips because it's more, more than that. Yeah, I um I don't know. I guess I mean it's it's well, you know, my classes are sometimes a little there's a lot more math probably than <laughs> <laughs> maybe they would maybe they would like more stories. The yeah, you know, I I guess I mentor a lot of students to work on this as well. I think that's I think it it's hard to know how to get I fell into this very much by accident and I didn't have anyone. That's not it's not quite true. There was there a couple of guys who were two or three years older than me, who were sort of their political scientists who were very economistic in their approach. A guy named Jeremy Weinstein oh. at Stanford and McCartan Humphreys at, at Columbia, who's, who's Irish as it turns out. And he, they, they, they were two or three years ahead of me and my wife and mentored us a little bit with what they knew. So it was a little bit, they'd probably be the first to say it was blind leading the blind to some extent. We in turn were mentored by a generation of economists who had, Maybe were the the path breakers, one or two generations of economists who were path breakers in going and really working deeply in developing countries. So, you know, my advisor was a guy named Ted Miguel who who had just done enormous amounts of on the ground field work and experimentation in, in Western Kenya, which wasn't insecure, uh, but but so it, you know, it's sort of, I wouldn't have been able to take to take the other than the fact that I wouldn't have been in Kenya if I wasn't working for him and others, but. I wouldn't have been able to take that step to run this field stuff if people hadn't broken that ground. And so now I think my generation has been breaking that ground for, for other scholars. And, 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 and I, I should say I was always mentored that anthropologists have been hanging out in these war zones forever. So, you know, you, you, when I went to northern Uganda, I was the only economist for 500 miles, but you swing a dead cat and you hit like six anthropologists <laughs> and, and many of them, uh, a lot of what I know and a lot of my whatever qualitative, whatever meager qualitative field skills I have, I learned from them. Mm. And so, so now I think if you see people, you look at the PhD applications and the master's students applications of the young kids that are now applying in and their mindset has totally changed. They've seen a set of people like my predecessors and me and now my students and so on. And, and, and now they're like, Oh, this is the new normal. And so people are going out. And so if anything, we have to be, a, we have to be, um, we have to be very cautious in actually now we have to get people to sort of tamp down their youthful enthusiasm and lack of risk aversion and, and actually do this responsibly. There's sometimes you now go to, you now go to humanitarian crises and conflict zones and there's dozens of masters and PhD students around writing, quote, doing quote unquote research projects in a completely sometimes irresponsible manner. And, and so it's actually started to shift in the opposite direction where there's, there's, there's a sort of a surge of relatively unguided research that has, is probably a net going to be do nothing. And it would be nice if it could do something, but, and, and, and some things will, be transformative but other things will be very risky yeah it's something that um there's a good you, you've done good writing on your own website about your advice for phd students and not that it goes into that t- type of aspect of it but there's some guidelines or recommendations as you know if someone asks you should to do a phd uh, it's it is a good mm-hmm. read and I'll, I'll put the link on the show notes page for people who want to, to uh, go onto your website and take a read of that too Again, I and other people have started, I mean, I have an old blog post on whether you should do research in a conflict zone and how and how to okay. think about it. It could probably use an update. There's an article coming out very, I think there's an article written by, um, 
I'm, I'm uh, forgetting her name, which I feel ashamed of because I've known her for many years. Uh, I, she was one of the authors of the Wronging Rights blog for many years. Kate, um, anyways, I'm blanking at the moment, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get you the link for that as well. I, and I think people who are now, for the people who think, oh, I'd like to do this, my first answer is great. And then my second answer is like take a deep breath and, and think about make sure you do this in a way that's safe for you, but especially safe for the places you're going to be, but the people in the places you're going to be working in. Yeah. Yeah. There, is it okay to ask you just quick fire questions or are you okay with that? Sure. Yep. Um, I'd love to know that if you could step into the DeLorean and time travel, what era would you like to go back to and who would you like to visit or speak? Oh to? my goodness. Well, I've, for, for idiosyncratic reasons, I fell into reading a lot about classical Greece and ancient Greek wars and sort of ancient Athens, uh, just trying to understand if some of the things I believe apply today, but why there's violence and what's going on applied in a very different era. And, uh, and it's made me just completely fascinated by, by this era and what was going on. And, and so that, uh, yeah, there, there would be few more fascinating places to drop into than, than maybe Athens 400, uh, BC. Yeah, maybe even um, beyond that. If you, I'm sure I don't know if you read Homer's Odyssey or the <laughs> Iliad, uh, and I talk to talk a lot about the, the wars there. The, the um, I'm just diving into this stuff. I've been reading more about the the, the more the the after the oral histories when they have actual histories, and yeah. so that's been you know the Peloponnesian Wars and things. So I've not yet delved. I've managed to buy on Amazon. The Iliad and the Odyssey, but they remain on my bookshelf. That's so it's uh, <laughs> aspirational. Well, I'll probably get through them, but aspirational. Uh, one of the nice things about being on a university campus is I said, you know what? I'm going to reach out to the most interesting classicist on the campus and ask her to lunch and have her tell me what I should read. And so we're actually having lunch on Friday. And okay. so this is that I figure that's a nice way to, uh, to try to sort of now that I'm dipped my toe in to figure out how to go further. It won't be in KFC anyway, will it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case people are wondering, again, on your bio, you mentioned that you, you cleaned grease traps, and that's something I had in common with you as well, actually, Chris, oh. because I did the same when I was working on a, a ferry crossing the Irish Sea from Ireland to Wales in the UK, oh, wow. and yes, grease traps are terrible, aren't they? <laughs> they were, yeah, that was, that was, yeah, the, maybe some of the most disgusting experiences of my life, but uh, maybe, maybe character building. Yeah, that's, that is absolutely true. Um, one more question I'd, I'd like to ask is a book recommendation. Usually I ask also bu- about some advice, but we went through that already when you uh, mm-hmm. spoke about conflict or uh, doing your research in conflict zones, but uh, recommend a book that you'd like to share with us, something that you might have read recently. Let's see. There's two authors that I, I so when I teach a class on, economic and political development to my master's students. Uh, I, by the end, I, I get them to read uh, a book called the anti-politics machine by an anthropologist named James Ferguson. And I get them to read a book, maybe all the books in a perfect world, but a book by James Scott, maybe seeing like a state or the art of not being governed. And what these two, who's a political scientist slash quasi anthropologist, and they approach international development and the kinds of bureaucratic planners and future politicians and NGO workers that we train here with a lot of skepticism. They, uh, they essentially try to see the fundamental failures that underlie any aspiring NGO worker, bureaucrat, politicians' plans – and identify why they tend to go wrong so often. And and the short answer is they, they kind of explain how anytime every program or policy has unintended consequences, and that's essentially code for we didn't understand the politics or the culture. And if we understood the politics or the culture and how it worked, none of this would have been unintended. This might have been foreseeable. And 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 they just go through example after example. And my goal is to just try to and they're fabulous books and they're both fabulous writers, but my goal is to try to, you know, subversively infect my very idealistic, do-gooding, ambitious, probably very successful in future students into, you know, just approaching this with a little bit more uh, 
humility and recognize the hubris, but also recognize that, um, that they, they probably have, they probably fail to understand how important it is to understand the, not just the economic system, but then the political and cultural system that underlies whatever problem it is that they're trying to solve. And to, to become, to not become what, what Ferguson calls anti-politics machines. Um, so that's, those, those would be my, my two recommendations. That's a great way to end anyway, Chris. And I like to say I learned a lot from you and I really appreciate having you on the show. Being a guest, it'll be episode 150. And, great. um, yeah, just talking about politics there, a previous guest I had, Darren Asimoglu, he said, quoting him here, that you should study political systems in an economics course. And again, that's quite infectious in what you're talking about today. And I hope that students are, are being exposed to that aspect of economics through political systems and politics too. Um, you can check out all links on this episode at economicrockstar.com forward slash Chris Blattman. Chris, thank you so much. You are an economic rock star. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, when, um, I mentioned about University of Waterloo sounds like what you were describing with the, 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 the left wing and the right wing. Mm-hmm. You think it'd be best to leave that part out? No, I think that's 20, that's 25 years ago. I don't think even any of those people are still there. So hey. I'm not too worried about it. Okay. Um, yeah, they may, uh, I, I was try, I tried when I said, I said, I tried to be careful that this was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So yeah. it's, it's probably, I think I was, it, it's a fair characterization of their department back then. So <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. That's okay. Chris. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Look, I really appreciate it. And, um, thank you so much again. And, uh, okay. My pleasure. Oh, and, uh, I remember the name. It's Kate Cronin Furman. Kate Cronin Furman. Okay. Yeah. Cronin dash Furman. All right, Chris. Okay, thank you. Thank right, you very much. Enjoy you. your week. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download, or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the economic rockstar website if you enjoyed this podcast why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economic rockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the economic rockstar community if you're listening to this episode on itunes or stitcher radio i would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it if you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com make sure you check out the back catalog of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.